NIC founder and your host, Bob Kramer. Thank you and good morning. Again, I'm Bob Kramer, founder and strategic advisor of NIC. Delighted to have you with us this morning in the 2018 Nick Talks. Now, for the Nick Talks this year, we deliberately chose to focus in on three areas that we think are critical for the future of our industry. One is innovation in care delivery. A second is culture and workplace workforce issues and work, workforce engagement and workforce satisfaction. And then lastly, technology, but not just any technology, but specifically technology that transforms, that we think has the potential to transform aspects of seniors' housing and care. So yesterday we heard about hospital at home, the health uh, impacts of loneliness and isolation, connected intelligence, and great places to work. Today we're covering the use of improvisation in caregiving, the key advancements that voice-enabled technologies uh, will bring, and work, workplace culture as an innovation tool. I hope you were inspired by the talks yesterday, that you've already had follow-up discussions with friends and colleagues about the ideas that most struck you. And we encourage you to share your favorites once the videos are available online. Now our goal with Nick Talks is to simulate conversation, innovation, and future thinking for NIC participants. Why do we think this is so important? Because we feel that and believe that we as an industry are entering in a period, into a period, a decade, that we view as one of disruptive innovation. What do I mean by that? Why? Well, disruptive innovation, again, not uh, a phrase we've coined, but looking at the work uh, on innovation by probably the key uh, writer and spokesperson about expert on innovation, Clay Christensen. Disruptive innovation, continuous innovation, is doing things better. And we all, every day in our businesses, want to do things better. Disruptive innovation is doing things differently. It's a, a whole new way of thinking about meeting the needs of the customer. And we think we're entering such a period we see two particular drivers of that. One, what I'll call the young old, and those in particular will be the boomers. We're not serving them yet, but 10 to 15 years from now, we definitely will be. But they're driving it as the young old because of their lifestyle and their values. And their lifestyle and values could not be more different from the greatest generation that has really been the customer and therefore has shaped the product that we have delivered, and delivered well over the last 25 years. So that is one, a different product because different lifestyle, different values. Secondly, I'd talk about the driver of the old old. And for the old old, there the driver is their care needs and the health care costs of, of delivering on those needs. And those two drivers, we think are key drivers for this period of disruptive innovation. Why is this important? And why am I glad that you're here today and participating in our Nick Talks this year? It's important because of the fact that in a period of disruptive innovation, you want to be the disruptor and not the disrupted. Because in business, disrupted companies usually go out of business. So when we look to the future, I'm incredibly optimistic about the opportunities in seniors' housing and care. I'm really bullish. But I'm bearish on the, on the ability of many companies to make the changes and adapt to this new customer and to how we're going to need to meet and, uh, the health care needs in a less expensive and more effective way of frail elders. So with that, this year we've given all of our speakers the same challenge. How is your work going to change the future of aging? Our first speaker today is Kelly Leonard. Kelly is the Executive Director of Insights and Applied Improvisation at the Second City and Second City Works right here in Chicago. His book, Yes And, Lessons from the Second City, 
was released to critical acclaim in 2015. Kelly co-created and now co-directs a new initiative, the Second Science Project, with the Center for Decision Research at the Booth School of Business at the University of Chicago, which looks at behavioral science through the lens of improvisation. For over 20 years, Kelly oversaw Second City's live theatrical divisions, where he helped generate original productions with such talents as Tina Fey, Stephen Colbert, and Amy Poehler. He's going to present for you this morning an entirely new way of thinking about caregiving with Alzheimer's and dementia residents. Please welcome Kelly Leonard. It's 2012 and I'm in my car in a parking lot at the Whitehall Rehabilitation Center in Deerfield, Illinois, and I am crying my eyes out. I've just come from a conversation that wasn't really a conversation with my mom who was suffering from dementia. Um, she didn't really know who I was. I would try to steer the conversation and get it back to reality and she still thought she was a nurse in Framingham, Massachusetts and I might be a doctor. And a few months later when she passed, I reflected on the fact that we really didn't connect in these sort of crucial last moments of her life and I was filled with such regret over that. A couple years later, I'm in my car, it's a Saturday, and I'm listening to This American Life on NPR, which I always listen to. And the story that comes on is about these two improvisers, and they are caring for their mom who suffers from dementia. And what they're doing is using improv skills to do this. And in particular, they talk about this idea around yes and. And the idea there is when groups of people are making something out of nothing, when they have no script, saying no doesn't get you anywhere. And you can't stop by just saying yes, you have to say yes and. You have to affirm and contribute in order to explore and heighten. And I pull over my car into another parking lot, this is the Walgreens on Ashland, and start crying again. <laughs> because I'm doing the edits on my book, Yes And, about how you can take improvisation into organizations and business to better collaborate and communicate, and I never ever thought I could use it for caring. So I'm out on book tour with my book, and any author who tells you they don't do this is lying. Uh, when you have written a book and you go to a new city, you go to a bookstore to see if your book is on the shelf. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to these various cities and I've written a business book and so I'm looking at the other business books and I notice something, that there's a lot of books on the art of negotiation in business and they all mention improv but don't go any deeper. So when I'm done with book tour and go back to Second City, my boss is like, do you got anything new you wanna create? And I'm like, yes. Well, if we found an academic and we collaborated on a negotiation and improv workshop, he's like, great, go do it. So I Google academic Chicago negotiation and I pick the first five professors who come from name universities in Chicago and I send them all emails. Uh, four of them get back to me within 24 hours. By the end of the week, I have got at least two who want to do the deal and one that I'm about to close the deal with. Uh, that's when I get an email from the fifth academic, Eugene Caruso at the University of Chicago. And he says, hey, I'm sorry I didn't reach out earlier, do you still want to talk? Now, old Kelly would have been like, I'm good, got this thing going. But new Kelly is in this like Shonda Rhimes year of yes bowl. <laughs> so I'm like, sure, let's meet. And he goes, great, I'm gonna invite my wife Heather, I think she'd be interested in this. So I go up to Hyde Park and I'm in their office talking to Eugene and Heather Caruso. And I'm doing my rap on improvisation and, and that rap includes this, that improvisation is yoga for your social skills, okay? Improvisation is loud, noisy group mindfulness. Improvisation is a practice in being unpracticed, which is how all of us live every single day. Eugene is checking emails, he's not interested. Heather, locked in. And when I finish, Heather says, Kelly, we're behavioral scientists, we have decades and decades of research that show us that people make bad decisions for themselves. You're talking about a practice and a pedagogy that allows people to make different and better choices. Those two things have never been put together. And a few months later, we announce this collaboration, the Second Science Project, which looks, which looks at behavioral science through the lens of improvisation. Uh, side note, the guy who signed off on this uh, at the Center for Decision Research at Booth was Richard Thaler, who would go on to win the Nobel Prize in economics. Pretty cool. Uh, so why? Why is this important? Uh, we have anecdotal evidence over 60 years at Second City that this stuff changes lives, but now we have evidence and data that can either back it up 
or allow us to make new discoveries. So I'll give you an example. Uh, so early on in the project, uh, we met with a bunch of the scholars and we had a bunch of improvisers and they said, take us through an improv exercise, let's put it in the lab. Um, so I'm gonna take you through an improv exercise, I'm not gonna make you improvise, calm down, it's all gonna be okay. Uh, we did this thing called yes and, uh, the yes and exercise. And we start by pairing up people, person A and person B. Person A is gonna pitch a reunion for today's event. Uh, person B, your job is to say no in as many ways as possible, go, do that for a minute. Uh, then we have person B pitch the reunion event to person A. Person A's job is to say yes but to every initiation, go. And when we unpack that with people, some people are like, yeah, that feels like a normal conversation at work. Uh, some people like the yes but better, but really that's just no with a bow tie. It's no different. And then we lead them through the third uh, pillar of this exercise, yes and. So your job, person A, is to pitch your idea. Person B, you say yes to it and add something. Person A, you say yes to that and add something, go. Invariably, the room is louder, there's more laughs. When I come to them later, they're having sushi on the moon, it's like nuts, it's great. Uh, yes and is a way to get to an abundant amount of ideas. So I give this kind of talk a lot to different business groups and invariably there's a guy, and it's always a guy in the back who raises his hand and says, if I yes anded every idea that came into my office, I'd get nothing done. Two things I know. That guy is a nightmare to work with. No one wants to work with that guy. And two, he is missing the point because yes and operates at the front end of innovation. It is five minutes at the beginning of a brainstorm. Just think about that, take that moment. Okay, so the scholars are watching this and they are like, get it, we got it. There's evidence to back up what you're doing. We'll give that to you, terrific. We have a problem and they're academics. They're supposed to look for problems. They said, what happens when you have an intractable situation? What happens when the person across from you, you can't yes and because you don't agree at all? Uh, and we're like, huh, I don't know, let's think about it. Do you have science on this? They go, we think we do. And so we started collaborating and we found the fourth pillar. And the fourth pillar is thank you because. And the idea here is if we're supposed to stay inside of this conversation and it's difficult and I disagree with you, but I need to stay inside it, we need to collaborate. The only way I can do that is if I thank you for what you gave me, setting off the gratitude part of the brain, and then the because is crucial, then I need to explain back to you what you just said and why it's important to you. And that person then will feel, they'll feel seen and they'll feel heard. And this is actually based on a, a scientific principle called self-verification theory. I think most of us think we wanna be seen as our best selves, our prettiest selves, our smarter selves. Self-verification theory shows us something different. It shows us that we want to be seen as we see ourselves. So if I see my, myself as clumsy, it's important that you see me as clumsy so you won't throw me a ball. But I'm a human being, I'm tricky, I'm not gonna say that to you. Uh, that same summer I got a call from Adam Grant, uh, the Wharton professor who wrote the book Give and Take, and he said, I've got a friend moving to Chicago, I, Jen Poo, will you meet with her? And I'm like, sure, because if I say no, I'll end up a villain in your next book. Uh, <laughs> I, Jen, uh, is a 2015 MacArthur Genius grantee. She is the co-director of Caring Across Generations. They are trying to change the conversation around caring. You also might know her as Meryl Streep's date at the last Golden Globes. And as I met her for lunch and I started talking about yes and a thank you because, she's like, this is what the caregivers need. This is what the whole caregiving community needs. Ways to communicate more effectively, especially when the realities are different. And so I brought in my wife, Ann Libra, and we worked with Caring Across Generations and presented an Improvisation for Caregivers program at the Aspen Ideas Festival. Uh, Ruth Allman at the Cleveland Clinic took our workshop and she got us a grant and we actually created a six-week Improv for Caregivers program at the Cleveland Clinic in Las Vegas. And it went really well and the data is really strong. Uh, same time period, I got the news that my brother Kyle uh, uh, was diagnosed with cancer and he was given two to five years, it was really two. And this last Christmas, uh, he got put into hospice. And I was able to take all of this stuff and bring it to his bedside. I stayed with him even when he was out of it, and we had really good, authentic conversations. And I was so sad, of course, when he passed, but I had no regret. So that's where the story was going to end when they invited me to do this talk. Um, but life is not scripted and other things have happened. Uh, on August 29th, Wednesday, uh, I had packed my bags and I was gonna go do a keynote 
uh, about this topic for the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio. When I got a call from my 16-year-old daughter, Nora, she had been having pains in her back and the pain was just terrible. So I turned around and I took her to the emergency room at Illinois Masonic and they had us go to Lurie Children's Hospital and that evening we found out that she was diagnosed with cancer in her liver and her lungs. So the last 11 weeks I've been a caregiver and I've been working with nurses and doctors and administrators and what have I learned? A few things. One, everything I'm telling you is 100% true. We have a phrase in improvisation, play the scene you're in, not the scene you want to be in. Because if I linger in the past or the future, I'm screwed. When I'm present with her in the moment, it's incredible. We have a phrase, see all obstacles as gifts. I don't want to be in this position. I have never spent such quality time with my daughter. We've had incredible moments. And we have a phrase, bring a brick, not a cathedral. So many of us try to solve our problems by bringing in these cathedrals when all we need to do is bring in bricks. Each of us participate, we're an ensemble. I've also learned that we're a culture that values youth over age. People were great when my parents were dying, but they weren't trying to move heaven and earth like they're doing with Nora. So I guess the lesson here is we have to value life and we have to give people skills and practice and agency in improvising their own scripts and we need to give people practice and skills and agency in writing better scripts. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. I want to just point out a theme that ran through the talks yesterday but Kelly did an incredibly moving job of really bringing forth very, very vividly. And that is that ultimately what life is about and therefore what really good seniors housing and care is about is connection. Connection, human connection. And being innovative in the ways in which we create that human connection, that sense of affirming to that person whether they're living in 1935 or 1952 or 2018, that you've heard them, that you value them, and that you're eager to be and to stay in a relationship with them. Human connection, human affirmation. In a culture that, as Kelly noted, glorifies youth, we have to be an antidote and we have to show that we value and desire to affirm the human connection and the, the value and the specialness of the elders with whom we uh, interact and have relationships with, relationships that give them a renewed sense often of meaning and purpose. So human connection. Our next speaker, Brett Kinsella, will discuss how voice activation is a critical part of the connected home. This technology has made a quantum leap forward recently that you may not be aware of. Brett is the founder, editor, and research director at VoiceBot.ai, the central source of voice and artificial intelligence industry data, research, news, and analysis. Includes more than 1,300 news articles. Professionals in the fields of marketing, media, technology, finance, and brand management consult it daily. And I hope soon, as a result of his time with us, leading executives in seniors housing and care will also be consulting it regularly. Since we were first introduced, I look forward to it every single day. Brett's going to introduce us to Voice First and why we need to be listening carefully. Please welcome Brett Kinsella. In the beginning was the word, and it was spoken. For millennia, our primary communication method was oral communication. That's why we talk about the oral tradition. Written communication, text, was time consuming, 
It was tedious. It was expensive. And very few people understood it. Things changed remarkably in 1440 AD. In Mainz, Germany, a man named Johannes Gutenberg, which many of us in this room will be familiar with, invented the modern printing press. And it changed everything. All of a sudden, at scale, we could communicate information, knowledge, everything that we wanted to communicate about our family history, our country's history. There was a revolution in mathematics, science, and the humanities because we are now able to build on the expertise of others because we could share this information more effectively. We found that it was really effective for correspondence. When computers came along, it was a great way to input data. What we found was we moved from an era up to 1440, which was mostly about the spoken word, and then we moved into an era which was about entering text and data, typing, manual interaction in order to tell our story, to share information. Now, the computer industry recognized this, and Gutenberg really had a textual stranglehold on how we interact with these devices. But voice is back. And it's, va and it's back because conversation is back because natural language processing technology has advanced tremendously in the last decade. There's a lot of terms associated with it, neural nets, deep learning. What I can tell you from a practical standpoint is voice now understands, or computers now understand what you say, and then they can do th something with that. So how do we know that this is actually a thing? How do we know that this is something that is out there? And the, one of the first places I look as an empiricist is I look at popular culture. Voice assistance, voice technology is showing up on The Tonight Show, on South Park, on Saturday Night Live, on countless YouTube parodies. Apple Siri, Amazon Alexa, Google Assistant, we see them on their phones. We see them in smart speakers like the Amazon Echo. We see them in other smart speakers like Google Home and the Apple HomePod. The adoption has really been tremendous. And when you look at it, if we go back to where we started in the modern era of voice, we can look at a point in time in 2011 when Apple Siri was introduced. Now, it was introduced to the amazement of many people which was followed by sort of broad scorn because it couldn't quite live up to all that great marketing that Apple did around it. But it started to change people's set of expectations. And then in 2014, when Amazon introduced the Echo, they didn't try to oversell it, and the technology was much better. It could do more things. It could understand more things. They leveraged the modern capabilities around automated speech recognition, natural language understanding, and it received tremendous user reviews. So as that's starting to get more adopted, two years later, Google introduces Google Home. And what we've seen is just a tremendous adoption rate. Smart speakers over a four-year period went from zero to 100 million devices worldwide. About 70% of those are in the US. You can imagine how large that is and how fast that growth rate is. Now, it took Apple Siri about seven years to be available on 500 million devices worldwide. Google Assistant came along two years to become available on 500 million devices. This is the level of adoption and the rate of adoption that we're talking about. And this leads to a conclusion here that Activate Forecast looked at technologies we've adopted over the last century or so. And smart speakers, are, uh, adoption is growing much faster than smartphones, which I think surprises many people certainly faster than TV, but even faster than the, than the internet. So the adoption curve is nearly vertical. But it's not just smart speakers. It's smartphones, it's headphones and earbuds, it's televisions, automotive in the car, many people have used that. It's even in appliances. And in fact, last month, there was the introduction of the first voice-activated microwave. <coughs> Now, there were a lot of snickers about it when it first came out. But then when you actually think about it, there's some really good use cases. It's, it, you're right next to it, but yet it's that much easier to do when you have voice. And that's one of the things that I think people underestimate. 
is how many and how use how many use cases and how many how useful they are with voice. But the other thing that this tells us is that voice is a thing. It's not a theory. It's not a, it's not a speculation that consumers will start adopting it. They are adopting it. It's a reality. And this is a reality that people in the elder living communities have to be aware of because it's changing expectations. The other thing it tells us is that microphones are almost everywhere. In fact, they're nearly ubiquitous now. What that means is we're gonna be able to talk into just about anything, the places we're in, when we're mobile, into our devices. Some people think that the user, it's a user interface revolution, that it's really just when we're hands-free and eyes-free, when we're walking, when we're exercising, when we're driving, when we're cooking, we will be able to speak, we'll be able to interact with technology, we'll be able to pull up information even though we don't have use of our hands or eyes because they're, they're otherwise occupied. But that's not really it. It is true that, that those are benefits of it. But that's not the fundamental change that's going on. The fundamental change is in the past, we always had to learn the language of the technology to use the technology. We all used a steering wheel to learn how to communicate with the automobile. The steering wheel is the language of that device. We learned how to type to input information into, into computers. We learned how to use a mouse to interact with a computer screen. We learned how to pinch, swipe, and touch in order to work with our, with our iPad or our mobile phone. The difference today is that voice turns that around. We always learn the language of the technology. Today, the technology understands our language, the language that we communicate in. It, that, that language is actually your voice. OK, so what does this mean from a use case standpoint? So entertainment is a really common use case for voice. You know, if you look at smart speakers, the most common daily and monthly use case is actually pulling up information like radio, uh, music, comedy, uh, talk radio. That's what people do. And, you know, it seems like a little thing, but it's all of a sudden you're able to say, hey, Google, play the radio station, or hey, Alexa, pull up this song. And it's just that simple. And you know what? It's not just music. I mean, people think about that because the smart speakers are almost ubiquitous now. We're talking about over 20% of U.S. population has these, and the, the, the growth rate is actually accelerating for adoption. But it's also television. You look at Roku, you look at NVIDIA Shield, you look at uh, Xfinity, you look at the satellite providers. They know they have to have voice in order to navigate their uh, visual media or else the consumers will go elsewhere. It's also about information. Comscore says that in three years, 50% of all search will be done by voice. Why? Because it's faster. Who wants to fumble with their phone to type in the query to get the information? You can just speak and you can get it back. And it's like having an expert in the room with you who's just speaking with you at any given time. There's also communication. You can just bring it up very quickly and you don't have to look through your contacts. You just say, I want to call my daughter, and it happens. You can just say, I want to send a text message and say what the message is, and you can say send, and it happens. Productivity. You can add items to a shopping list so that you can get them later. You can do it while your hands are busy. You could be washing the dishes. You can pull up your calendar immediately. From a shopping standpoint, if you're out of something, you just say reorder, and it happens. Right? These are all little things, but cumulatively, they have a tremendous impact. From a smart home standpoint, you're able to control your thermostat, your lights. You're able to uh, uh, change your television uh, station. You're able to do all these different things by speaking and not having to fumble with some new piece of technology. And even when it comes to health and wellness, it's easier to record that data, and it's easier to get information back about it. You know, I think about a guest I had on my podcast not too long ago, Kathy Pearl. She works for Google now, but she spent many years in the healthcare space. And one of the things they were doing is they were helping physicians collect data from patients while they were at home. And they had a, an online portal that people could type in information. And then they added voice as an option for an input. What happened? <coughs> the patients actually logged in more often. Gave them, they, when they did log in, they gave them more data. And guess what? The data was more accurate. So typing and text became a barrier to actually getting that information. Now, let's talk about this from a practical consideration. 
And let's talk about it specifically about our elder community because the digital revolution has left a lot of people behind. And some, one of the groups is clearly our elder community. Voice makes interaction easier. So you think about this idea of small, t small buttons to type in, small text to read, voice you just ask and you receive it. So that interaction is a, is a significant difference and it can really change people's lives. I think about another guest from my podcast who talked about the first week uh, they, they started the business, they said, okay, we wanna do something around voice. They put a smart speaker in the home of a gentleman who was legally blind and they left it there for a week and they came back and they said, what did you think? He said, it changed my life. I have access to things that I've never had access to before. Another thing I wanna talk about is this idea of control. We talked about smart home. Talk about the independence that people have that they don't have to ask somebody to help them. They can actually just say something and things change for them. And it's, the house is more comfortable. And then there's communication. There's tools like Ask My Buddy, uh, which will allow you to say a s simple phrase and it'll contact multiple people. So if you need to reach out to people very quickly, it really makes a big difference for the elder community who might otherwise be isolated as we talked about yesterday with one of our speakers. And one of the most popular topics today is aging in place. And I think we heard yesterday about this idea of living in place. It's not just passing the time, it's actually having a more fulfilling experience. And voice is really transforming things because of this idea that you can have more independence. You're not cut off, you have communication. You can, you can call your family easily, or you can add items to a shopping list that's shared with your daughter who might be at the store bringing things over for you today. So all those things enable people to be more independent and have a much better chance of actually living a rich and fulfilling life at home. But let's talk about our elder communities as well. Voice is having an impact there, and voice can have an even bigger impact. So if you think about when someone wakes up in the morning, what do they need? So if they, if they have limited mobility, one of the things that they might need is to uh, turn on the lights, maybe turn on the TV, open the blinds. With, with voice technology, they can just say, a, a, set up a, what they call a routine. They can just say, Alexa, good morning, or hey Google, it's time to wake up. And all those things happen automatically. They don't have to call for someone, they don't have to wait, they don't have to feel like they're helpless and they need someone else to help them. They start their day off on a positive note because they have that control and they start it. Now think about this from the organizational level from the caregiver level. What does it mean for them? Well, they don't have to go around to every room to do the routine tasks. The, the residents can do it themselves. So what does that mean then? They can spend more time with the residents attending to other needs as opposed to things that anybody could do, you would think, but are really important if they can't do it for themselves. And so I just bring this up is, is another point. There are a lot of home builders in the US that are today actually pre-installing voice and smart home technology into their communities. And they do that because it makes those communities more attractive to the home buyers. The, there's other apartment uh, management companies that are doing the same thing. And this is something that the elder uh, residential communities are gonna have to think very clearly about. And, and one company that's done this in San Diego, uh, Front Porch, has had tremendous success with this already. And you think about you know, one of the women who had the opportunity to you know, have a smart speaker in their house said, everything is better with Alexa, right? Because they had that control, they, they had that ability to have more independence and it really transformed their lives. So as you think about this and you think about where the future is going, you think about this idea that you can create a better experience, you can be a more attractive community, and you can have more operational efficiency where your caregivers can focus more on needs that require humans and not the mundane tasks. Voice is really transformative and it is the technology that'll make a significant difference. So let me return to Gutenberg. Thomas Pettit, who's an academic in, out of the UK, calls the last 600 years the Gutenberg parenthesis. It was preceded by an oral tradition, 
And today, now, voice is coming back. And it's coming back because the technology has progressed to the point where it understands us. We no longer need to learn the language of the technology. The technology can understand our language. And the people that most need this, the elder community, are really going to be disproportionately benefited by it. It's just a matter of us making sure that it becomes available. Everyone, thank you for being here today. Welcome to The Voice Revolution. See it, get it, connection. It's about connection. We had connection between caregiver and resident through improvisation. And now we have connection through technology, enabling the resident to have more of a sense of autonomy, more of a sense of independence, enabling you with the staffing pressures that you all face to use your staff more effectively, more efficiently, so connection. Now many of you uh, this morning are actually watching this live, live streamed on your devices. That is commonplace today. A few years ago it wasn't possible. I know because we tried to do it and it didn't work. <laughs> now it does. So that's great. The challenge to you this morning, though, is to think of the things you're hearing here and that you heard yesterday. Which of these things are going to be, of course, in elder care in five years or ten years? And what do you need to be doing so you're not left behind and you're disrupted? Now, our final speaker today is Dwayne Clark. He's our only industry insider this year. And we're actually inviting him back. It's been a, more, a dozen years since Dwayne has uh, spoken on the NIC stage. And we're delighted to have him back. Dwayne's a thought leader and innovator in our industry. He's the co-founder and CEO of Aegis Living, a company of 2,300 employees across the West Coast, serving residents in 30 assisted living communities with 10 more under development. He's been involved in the development or management of over 200 seniors housing projects and has been recognized for individual and corporate leadership and citizenship. I invited Dwayne this morning to speak about his innovative approach to workplace culture and how that's translated into his company's success. Very specifically, last year, Aegis Living placed in Glassdoor's top 50 best places to work not across senior housing, but across all industries, out of more than 600,000 companies across the U.S., across all industry sectors that were surveyed. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Dwayne Clark. At my annual kickoff speech at our corporate meeting, one of the first things that I do is I invite my staff to leave the company. Now you may say, is he crazy? Well, I don't think I am. While uh, my, that very authentic offer, a couple people take it, me up, up, uh, up occasionally, the majority of people are overwhelmingly delighted to work for our company. And that's what I want to talk about today. How do we create a continuous culture of contentment that's sustainable? You see, we have a big problem in our industry. In the next 18 months, the need for caregivers is going to overtake the need for retail workers. It's an incredible dilemma. And we have huge turnover in our industry, north of 150%. Unemployment is at a historic low. Now, some of you may say, well, my strategy is I'm just going to poach, steal, kidnap people from my competitive company, make them an offer they can't refuse. It's one strategy, but here's why I don't do that. About 20-some years ago, I was at a conference very much like this. I, let me, and I, I had a care manager that had worked for me three years previous. 
and she'd left my employment. She was making about $8 an hour. And at this conference, I saw her, and she said, Dwayne, it's great to see you. I'm, hey, it's great to see you. What are you doing now? She goes, I'm now vice president of operations overseeing a $100 million portfolio. And why I was generally happy that this person had gone from an activities director making $8 an hour to overseeing a $100 million portfolio, I walked away from that conversation and I thought, wow, is our industry just recycling people from company to company, paying them more money, hoping, no, not hoping, praying they do a good job. And then what happens to innovation? What happens to the creativity if we're just recycling people from company to company? And I made a vow to myself at that point that I wasn't going to do that. I wasn't going to hire my managers from other assisted living companies. So I looked at all kinds of industries. I looked at the restaurant industry. I looked at the retail industry. And one of the things that I found was pretty obvious. The hospitality industry, the hotel industry, had a lot of parallel skills, the core competencies that we needed. But here was the problem. Even with hotel managers, they only brought 70% of the core competencies to the table. The 30% that they didn't have was obvious. They didn't have the clinical, the medical, the knowledge of aging and Alzheimer's and all those things. So I made a controversial decision that we were going to have our managers, before they took any responsibility on, I wanted to give them 100 days of training. Not 100 hours, 100 days. It was incredibly expensive. Now you may say, that's crazy. You know, I'm just going to go out and hire somebody from another, another company, then they come with those skills, and I don't have to give them a training, and in three days they can be running a building. Why would you do that, Dwayne? Well, the answer is pretty obvious. What we ended up with was a more professional, more intelligent, a better business person. But beyond that, beyond that, they didn't bring the baggage of their old assisted living companies. They were new. They were creative people. I call it the weaving of the quilt because they brought these experiences from this other company. To Each person brought a piece for the quilt. But it doesn't stop there. You see, it's not just good enough to hire people. You got to keep them. You got to create a culture that is important. And so one of the things that we did is we formed a foundation. Our own foundation for our employees called the Potato Soup Foundation. See, the Potato Soup Foundation is a very personal story to me. I was the youngest of four kids. Um, my mom was a line cook. We were poor. Not like poor like you couldn't buy the new Jordans poor, but poor like we didn't have food. And so one day my mom came home from work in our tiny one-bedroom apartment. She walked in the door and she goes, we don't, have an, we don't have a lot of money. We don't have any money. And as a smart aleck 16-year-old kid, I said, well, what's new? And she walked over to the refrigerator in our tiny little one-bedroom apartment. And she opened the, the refrigerator door and I can see that light going on. And it had an onion, a cube of butter, and a can of condensed milk. And she shut the refrigerator and she said, I'm going to have to steal some potatoes from work. And I think we can eat potato soup for two weeks. Now, shocking statement. You know, my mother had never stolen anything in her life. She said, I'll pay him back with interest. Now, during that two weeks that we ate that potato soup, some of the most profound business advice I ever got. She said, you know, I know you're going to take on some level of responsibility and you're probably going to manage staff and you're going to rise to some level of greatness, but here's the thing I want you to know. You have to be smart enough to know that from time to time your employees are going to be in dire need and need your help. And if you're there for your employees, your employees will always be there for you. Incredibly insightful words. The Potato Soup Foundation has gone on to pay for medical expenses, to pay for education, to pay for funerals, to pay for housing and courses of domestic violence. But here's what I never anticipated would happen. There was a miracle of sorts. We offered that if, if line staff wanted to contribute to the Potato Soup Foundation through automatic payroll deduction, it didn't matter if it's 50 cents or a dollar or $10 or whatever, two weeks, hey, we didn't push them, we didn't recruit them, we said, hey, it's open to you. Today, Today, almost 500 people contribute. And that's become their family, their culture. It's not us shoving that on them. 
That's their culture of their company. They're providing for each other. But it doesn't stop there. You see, about 15 years ago, I got up, I read the newspaper, I went in, I read some training materials, and then I talked to a care manager who was saying, I'm so stressed out about my job. And I thought about all this turmoil in our world, and I thought, where do our people go? Where do our employees go to recharge? They're stressful jobs. People dying, people combative, Alzheimer's conditions. Where do they go? What if I, what if I created my own self-development conference? And we did. We created a conference called EPIC. EPIC stands for Empower People, Inspire Consciousness. It has nothing to do with work, nothing to do with aging, nothing to do with seniors. In fact, if you're caught talking about your business, your census, your NOI, any of those good things, you're fined. $25. Guess where it goes? Potato Soup Foundation. So Epic has had some of the most profound A-listers in the country. We've had over 100 speakers. We had Sylvester Sloan last year, Deepak Chopra, Gina Davis, Susan Sarandon, Carlos Santana, Tim Kennedy Jr. We have seven or eight great speakers every year. People say, this is the way I recharge. They have profound experience over that three days. But it doesn't stop there. You see, before I started Aegis, I worked for another senior housing company. And I know this may shock you, but I was an idea machine. I would go into my CEO and I'd say, hey, I have this idea. Oh, OK. Hey, I have this idea. Next day, I have this idea. And after about four or five idea sessions with Dwayne, he said, ah, idea moratorium on Dwayne. No more. No more. So I took my ideas and I walked dejected back to my office and I stuff them in this black box. And guess what happened to that black box? When I started my own company, they become the principles, the hallmarks, the foundation, the business plan of our company. But I wanted a learning from that. And I thought, hmm, how did I feel about that? So we put a black box in every one of our communities, but that wasn't good enough. We then put a process owner in charge of the black box. We have a person that said, hey, it's black box time. You know, any day you can put an idea in here. That's not good enough. Then we started publishing the ideas. That wasn't good enough. Then we started financially rewarding people for the ideas. Some of our best programmatic ideas in the company have come from the black box. Now, here's the situation. People don't see it as my company as the founder. Because they have their ideas in play, they see it as their company. But that's not good enough. About three years ago, I was walking through our corporate office and I was reading a brochure. And it was a recruiting brochure. And I was walking through the office, I stopped and looked at, around the office and said, well, this is a nice little flat piece of material. It's telling all these great things about our company, but can, the, can our potential employees really see it? And does this office really speak to our corporate soul? And I had to be honest with myself. I had to say, no, it doesn't. So guess what? I sold that office. I bought another office twice the size. And I sat down with the architects and the designers, and I said, I want to build a building that shows my corporate soul. They looked at me a little weird. And I said, I want people to know that we have philanthropy and we have a purpose wall. I want people to see our mission, our purpose, our values. Yes, and I even built a tree house in the backyard because I wanted people to be childlike and have fun. That's become one of our most popular conference rooms. In fact, vendors call now and say, I'm coming over on Thursday. Can we meet in the tree house? So who ha I wanted people to see that we're disruptive. Who has a chopper in their office with some of the world's most profound thinkers? that really define disruption. And something else happened. See, in our old office, when we interviewed employees, our closing rate was about 63, 64%. Guess what it is in the new office? 95%. You think that's an accident? I don't think it is. But it doesn't stop there. You see, I know many of you, many of you do great things for your employees. You know, the birthday parties and the anniversaries and the trips and so on. A lot of fun things. But guess what? Today, today in this environment, 
people want more than fun. They have a social conscience. Last year, I led a march on civility on Washington, D.C. I was the chairman of the march with a young man next to me, Ken Wadicki, who's the head of the Free Hugs movement. There was hundreds of people that marched. I was able to speak from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial where Martin Luther King gave his I Have a Dream speech. It was broadcast live on C-SPAN for over six hours to over eight million people. Guess what? I also brought 100 care managers. People said it was one of the most profound experiences of their lives. They could not believe that I would take them to this conference. But it doesn't stop there. You see, every year, every holiday season, our corporate office turns into a retail store. We give away coats, we give away toys, we give away clothing, we give away food, we give away cash to our staff and their families. Over 600 people come through the doors that day. Our corporate executives are the workers. And for those of you who are in a location that you can't get to the corporate office, we have a, a mobile Winterfest, that's what we call it, Winterfest RV, that goes to your community. People so appreciate that we celebrate their family with them. But it doesn't stop there. You see, I was talking to a care manager one day, and she was getting off shift, and I said, hey, where are you going? She goes, I'm going to go play the Mega Millions lottery. I said, oh, come on, what's your chance of winning? She goes, you know, it's just fun, Dwayne, and there is an opportunity someday that I'm going to win, and I'm going to do this. And I, okay, good luck. And I walked away from that conversation, and I said, what if we had our own lottery? I have to tell you, when I floated this to my senior management team, they thought I'd kind of lost it. I said, no, we could have our own lottery because what if we use this and told every employee that as long as you have one year in service, you're eligible for the lotto, and every year after, you get an additional ticket. More chances. If you're a five-year employee, you have a chance to win is one in 250, not one in 300 million, one in 250. We give away over $70,000 net, $70,000. Top prize is $50,000 net, we pay the taxes. It's life-changing money for these people. We do it twice a year. People bought cars, they've gone on vacations, they bought homes, and yes, yes, even some people have left the company, which is okay. Now. I know a lot of you may be saying, geez, Dwayne, this seems like great PR, um, good ideas, but who cares? Why should I do this? Well, first of all, we've been voted best company to work for by various publications 14 times. As Bob mentioned, we were a top 50 company out of over 650,000 companies voted on. Guess who recognizes that? Our staff. Our recruitment efforts are better. Our families. Because you know what our families say? Man, if you take that good care of your staff, I know, I know you're going to take good care of my mom. Because the greatest barrier we have in our industry is trust. So it works. But here's the warning I want to give you. Culture's tough. It's an it's a expectation of every one of my senior team and every employee that every day they go out and try to find a creative benefit to improve the lives of our staff and improve the lives of our culture. Second thing I will tell you is that not everybody agrees on culture. I've had to actually end relationships with partners who didn't see culture the same way as I did. And the last thing I will tell you, if you're a... VP of Ops in this room or VP of HR, and you're thinking, I'm going to go take back these ideas. I'm going to implement this. I'm going to change the culture of our company. If your CEO does not get on board, if your CEO is not the driver of cultural change, you're doomed. Your CEO has to be the champion. So I'm going to throw out a challenge to you. You know, don't just try to get people involved in your great capitalistic goals of growing your company. 
and being a good company. I challenge you to create a phenomenal, phenomenal culture. I thank you. Again, you get it? Connection. Connection in this case, how do companies truly connect with their employees at all levels? Led by the example and the engagement of the CEO, but how do companies connect in a way that there's meaningful work, workforce engagement in the company? As we look to this period, this coming decade of disruptive innovation, I would posit to you that there'll be a lot of companies that are going to have great str strategies, great strategic plans. And there'll be a number of, comp of those companies that will also have very good access to capital and be very well capitalized. But we'll what will actually distinguish the real winners from the losers will be culture. Because if you don't have the people to execute at every level, in particular on the front line, no amount of strategy and no amount of capital is going to do you any good. And with the challenges that we face in terms of labor and workforce, which are not going to be cyclical even if we won't be staying in a full employment economy, this is going to be key for our sector. And it's why we put so much emphasis this year on culture and workplace and workforce engagement, because we think it's just that important. Now, I want to close by giving you just a little bit of perspective, because in one sense, you've been hit with a lot of uh, provocative, exciting ideas. And most of us are somewhere along a spectrum between on the one end, kind of, oh my gosh, so many fantastic ideas and everyone's already out doing this and I'm way behind and gee, this is all going to happen, I'm going to get left behind. So that's kind of one extreme. The other extreme, you're more likely, you're less likely to be at this extreme because you're here, is, you know, this is very entertaining, but it's really I come for entertainment because I love to hear about all the fads and trends that everyone gets excited about and all, so many of my colleagues in business go and run off and make these investments and then they, you know, that's the fad, the, 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 the fad du jour and they've wasted a lot of money and I don't think anything's fundamentally going to happen that's going to change my product or my business model. Well, with that type of, of attitude, I want to suggest to you this quote that I've always loved by Bill Gates because I think it so much frames how we might think about entering a period of disruptive innovation where he says, we always overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10. So are all these things you've heard about going to take over the senior housing and care space in the next two years? And if you don't do them all right away, are you sunk? Absolutely not. But if you don't see them transform the space in the next two years, and you then settle back and say, I told you so, I don't really have to worry. Nothing's fundamentally going to disrupt my business model or make me change my product. Remember, these things are, we're, you're underestimating the change that's going to happen in the next 10 because we are entering a period of disruptive innovation. And again, you don't want to be the disrupted. You want to be the disruptor, because the disrupt disrupted are going to go out of business. So I want to thank our speakers today, uh, Kelly and Brett and Dwayne, and all of our speakers for this year's Nick Talks. And they've inspired and challenged us, but now the challenge is over to you. What are you going to do with this? And I hope you'll take an idea or ideas that have really moved you. Share it with colleagues. Talk with them. Get them to also uh, uh, watch the, the, the talks when they're put up online in a few weeks. But particularly, don't make this entertainment. Make this something that inspires you to action. 
be the folks that are going to disrupt our space and our elders are going to be the ones that are going to be the beneficiaries. So thanks for coming. Thanks for attending the NIC uh, 2018 Fall Conference and our, our Nick Talks. Feel free, we'd love your ideas about the ideas or the speakers you think belong on this stage in the future that you'd like to hear from. Have a great trip home wherever you're going. For those of you listening on your uh, streaming devices, remember, which of the ideas you've heard today are gonna be commonplace in just five years? Thanks a lot, everyone. <laughs>